Let us bow our heads for prayer. Father, we lift up our hearts and our hands in total praise because you are an awesome God. We are thankful for the gift of life. We bow down before you to thank you for the gift of fellowship and friendship. And we thank you also for the gift of health. And that we can come together and assemble in this thy house of prayer for all nations to bring our supplications and our prayers before you. And we know, Lord, that you are good to us. And so as we share the word together, we pray that you may favor us by your presence, that when we go out of this place after the service, we may truly each one testify that the Lord indeed came and tabernacled with us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of um, Psalm chapter 150, verse 6, which says, Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. I have so many reasons to thank the Lord for this morning. In fact, when I woke up this morning, I told my wife, um, Tulu, that I'm overwhelmed by what God has done in my life. He has done too many things. Um, and every day I find myself having so many reasons to be thankful for. And I hope this is your attitude too. You know, I've read volumes and volumes of people who pick up on a topic and start complaining. I have never seen even a small little thin book on praises to God for what he has done for us. People just like complaining, especially when we are South Africans. We have got so many things. And Adventists, Adventists have got 28 fundamental complaints. We, we, we like to be on the gloomy side of things. And we can't blame ourselves. We live in the context of the great controversy, the war between good and evil. We are casualties of that war. And we are almost always reminded by the devil himself that we are in this world. And so I understand when we can complain about electricity, which is a swear word in South Africa. Um, we can complain about ESCOM. They are not doing fine. But the truth of the matter is, if we can just simply pause and stop and think and meditate, you will discover that there are more things to be thankful for than things to complain about. We can thank God that the sun shone this morning. The birds are singing. The flowers are blooming and we still have life. We did not turn into statistics of those who have passed away in South Africa today. Our hearts are still beating, keeping the beat which God has blessed us with. And so we need to thank him. So I thought today I need to share with you things I'm thankful about. At one point I picked up, um, I've got two beautiful daughters. Um, and I have three beautiful granddaughters. Um, and I can see now you're saying, now how old is this old man? I'm really old. I was born in 1960. Well, I was born, okay. <laughs> um, 
So IFA is a typical um, beautiful, quiet, respectable girl. And so Moano is what you could call your um, um, almost, she, she will be the one who is telling the older sister when we are, when they are, you know, we are putting them in the car and she will say to the sister, ladies first. Um, or she will achieve something from school and come excitedly and she will come to say, dad, 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 guess who is the man, okay? Um, but one day we were going out and I kept on complaining about uh, why I am, f it's cold today, the, you know, the weather is so bad, um, I, I just kept on complaining. And, and just when we were about to get into the car, Ifa turns around and says, Daddy, do you have something warm in your wardrobe? I said, yes. She says, why don't you just simply stop bothering God and go and have something to put on? And, and you know, embarrassed, I turned around, went back into the, into the, into the house, and I went and picked up a, something warm to, and I stopped complaining against the weather. We love complaining. I, I'm not saying it is not right for us to complain. We have the right to complain, but it is important for us to also know that when you think that you have got mountains you cannot tunnel through, rivers you cannot cross, when you think that you have things that are difficult, that are happening in your life, Please remember that somewhere in the world there is someone who is in a worse off situation than yourself. And you need to assume the attitude of prayer and praise to God. We can be thankful to God for the food we eat, for the clothes we wear. Some of us here came a bit late because we we're trying to make up which one do I put on today. Um, and many people who understand can actually relate to me. We put on shoes and we say, this is not good for the day. Put on dresses and we say, there are people who have got no dresses. They have got nothing to, to, they have nothing to choose from because they've got only one pair of shoes. And we need to, thank, to be thankful to God that God has actually taken care of us. There are people who love worrying. I was actually telling um, the old people at Magnolia that uh, a friend of mine told me of a story. In fact, it was Maurice Venden, long time ago in one of his sermons, he's late now, uh, who said, uh, people love worrying. When God says, uh, bring all your cares upon me, I will, because I care for you. Uh, they, they just simply worry, they don't bring their cares to Jesus. He said, this man was so worried that he decided that from that day, he was going to outsource the worrying factor in his life, give it to somebody else to do it for him, and then he will pay him for worrying on his behalf. Um, and his, the man said, how much are you going to pay me? He said, I'm going to pay you 2,000 rands per, per, year, per month. All you need to do is that I will stop worrying about my children. I will stop worrying about my job. Stop worrying about my wife. I'll stop worrying about my children, my, 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 my dog, my cat. You just do the worrying for me. Um, and he said, that's fine, no problem at all. His friend overheard the conversation between the two of them before they signed the contract. And he pulled him aside and said, but you say you are going to pay the man 2,000 rands per month and you are not working, you have no job. Where are you going to get the money? He says, that's the first thing he needs to start worrying about. <laughs> Because if he does not worry and bring a solution, he will not be paid at the end of the month. We love worrying. Man, let me tell you something. We have got so much to be thankful God, to be thankful, to be thankful about. I, I was not born an Adventist, and I'm not suggesting that even if you are born around the area of the pulpit, you become a Seventh Adventist. But I'm so happy that I'm an Adventist. 
We may not know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. And that is what hope is all about. Somebody said, the body needs lots and lots of water to carry out many essential functions, such as balancing the internal temperature and keeping cells alive. As a general rule of thumb, a person can survive without water for about three days. An article by Achiefer Criminology, and I think, I, I hope I'm pronouncing it well, states the body can survive for eight to 21 days without food or water, and up to two months if there is access to an adequate water, to adequate water intake. Modern day hunger strikes have provided insight into starvation. You can survive three minutes without breath, breathable air, uh, and you, you know, you can you know, suffer unconsciousness there. Generally with protection or on icy water, that's how much you can survive for. Uh, you can survive three hours in a harsh environment, extreme heat or cold, in extreme heat or cold. You can survive three days without drinkable water. You can survive three weeks without food. But somebody said, men can live about 40 days without food, about three days without water, about eight minutes without air, but only for one to four seconds without hope. And we are prisoners of hope. God has given us, there is this hope that burns within us, that makes us to know that we are pilgrims in this, uh, in this world. We seek for a city and maker whose, be, and, and city whose maker and builder is God himself. And so I'm so happy that we are people of hope. I heard us talk about the judgment this morning, and it reminded me to thank God one more time. I once did the stupidest thing in my entire life. I appeared before the judge without a lawyer, and that is not a smart thing to do. I thought I could use my theological obfuscations to protect, my, to defend myself, and when they were, the trial was starting, I had an accident with a gentleman who was driving a motorbike very fast. Before I could, you know, understand what was happening, he was literally in the air, 50 meters in the air. He came and dashed down. It was him and the motorbike, him and the motorbike, and finally we went to court to uh, solve the dispute. And when I arrived there, the judge kindly asked me, Mr. Maligudu, and I said, yeah, and he said, would you, want to bring a lawyer to speak on your behalf. I said, no, I don't want a lawyer. I will speak on my, on my I, I, will, I will do my self-defense, they say. I said, no, that's fine. After questioning me for two days, unrelenting, the prosecutor was, they finally found that, they finally stuck to one question. They said, did you, did you do K-53 training? I said, yes. They said, did you see the man when he was coming behind, from behind you? Because you need to check on the rear view mirror all the time. I said, no, I did not. It was like very fast. And just when I was, there was a thud and the man turned around and they said, no, 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 no. Just, it's a yes or no question. Mr. Maligudi, did you see the man coming from? I said, man, he was so fast. Uh, he was so fast, he, he, I, I, there was nothing, I just, they said, no, Mr. Maligudi, it's a simple question. Did you see the man, did you see the man coming from behind you? I finally considered that I did not see the man, and they said, well, we, are, we, are, we think you are a reasonable person. We are not going to say you were reckless uh, and negligent. We are simply going to say you were negligent, and therefore, you are going to be, we are giving you six months in jail. And I was thinking, oh my God, am I going to stay six months in jail? Now I will be the beneficiary of prison ministry from the church, uh, coming to see the pastor and everything like that. And, uh, but I realized that day that it is important for me to have a lawyer by my side. The next thing was that a civil case when the gentleman needed money from a Seventh Adventist pastor and he said he needed 90,000. That was in 1989. And I looked at it in 19, 1998, sorry. Um, I looked at it and I said, man, if I pay him 90,000, I'm left with nothing. But then I discovered that this church, the Seventh Adventist Church, is so good to its pastors. We have 
CETCOM, not ESCOM, okay? CETCOM, which takes care of the legal needs of all the pastors. Uh, and we are thankful to that. And I went, and when I went to talk about the story, they said, no, don't worry. Even in the first appearance, we could have actually helped you. And I was so negligent. I went and they got a Mr. Marion, a Mr. Marion who um, uh, you could say he, the man occupies, tall, powerful, and powerful looking, very imposing. And when the other side saw that I have this powerful lawyer, they immediately said we are going to have an, what is it called, an out of court settlement. Um, but when I listened to what they were talking about, I discovered that I was stupid from the beginning, that I have gone ahead and thought I could protect myself, thought I could pick, talk about myself uh, before the, a judge, uh, whereas I could have brought the, brought the lawyer. We are not afraid of the judgment. Um, and I was happy to say the judgment to us is the good news. Do you know the reason why? Because the judge is also our father. He's also our friend. The judge who is going to be determining issues of life and destiny is not a stranger, is not an enemy to us. He loves us so much. And so we are not afraid of the judgment. We know that judgment will be for God's people at the end. And so we are happy. We are thankful to God that he can provide our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ a lawyer who has never lost a case. And if you can just simply stand around him or make him to stand for you, you will never lose a case. And so we need to assume the attitude of gratitude. I wish I could go to the screen now. Uh, the book of Proverbs chapter 17 verse 22 says, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. It is a beautiful thing to be positive, not to have melancholic thought, thoughts always. It is important for you to have a, in fact, it says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Um, Ellen G. White says, disease is sometimes produced and is often greatly aggravated by the imagination. Many are lifelong invalids who might be well if they only thought so. Many die of diseases, the cause of which is wholly imaginary. They have no way, they have no time to think about the positive things which God is doing in their lives and therefore they get sick because of that. Nothing tends to promote health of body and of soul than does a spirit of gratitude and praise. It is a positive duty to resist melancholy, melancholy, discontented thoughts and feelings as much as a duty as it as much a duty as it is to pray. If we are heaven bound, how can we go as a band of mourners, groaning and complaining along the way to our heavenly Father, to our Father's house? It is important for us to know that, especially as Christians, especially as children of God. We need to search for those things we can be thankful for all the time. And we have just discovered it. That it is not only good for uh, making sure that we, uh, we remember what God has done in our lives, but it, it is also good for our health. It will save us a lot of money. And it will keep doctors away. Those professed Christians who are constantly complaining and who seem to think cheerfulness is sin have not genuine religion. We are told by psychologists that when you tell somebody that you love them, it actually even improves their immune system. Um, and I keep on uh, making sure that I put a rider there that I'm not saying for those of you who are not yet married, go to a lady and then you say, well, I love you, I just want to boost your immune system it is not going to be really good enough. But the truth of the matter is, when people are told, when people are affirmed, when people are told that they are good, 
they tend to actually assume the posture or the behavior which you are imposing upon them by affirming them. It is important for us to know that if we continually complain, we will be living in a gloomy life and it will actually send us to depression. Those who take a mournful pleasure in all that is melancholy in the natural world, who choose to look upon the dead leaves rather than to gather the beautiful living flowers, who see no beauty in grand mountain heights and in valleys clothed with living green, who close their senses to the joyful voice which speaks to them in nature and which is sweet and musical to the listening ear are not in Christ. That's how strong she says. When someone asks you how you are feeling, do not try to think of something mournful to tell in order to gain sympathy. Do not talk of your lack of faith and your sorrows and sufferings. The tempter delights to hear such words. When talking on gloomy subjects, you are glorifying him. We are not to dwell on the great power of Satan to overcome us. Instead, we are, often we give ourselves into his hands, meaning the devil, by talking of his power. Let us talk instead of the great power of God to bind us up all, to bind up all our interests with his own. Tell of the matchless power of Christ and speak of his glory. All heaven is interested in our salvation. The angels of God, thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000 are commissioned to minister to those who shall be heirs of salvation. So you can't complain when you know that heaven has taken time to make a provision. And by the way, it is not a thing for everybody. It is a particular salvation. It's a personal thing. God plans for you alone. He sends heavenly angels every day to take care of you, to put a hedge around you so that you may be safe always. Thousands upon thousands, which we cannot see with our naked eyes. And this is everything what God does. This is what God does on a daily basis for us. The Bible says, in everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. This is an assurance that even the things which appear to be against us will work for our good. God will not bid us be thankful for that which will do us harm. At one point, when you uh, are a pastor, you are faced with so many challenges. At one point, I was asked to go and conduct a funeral service of a stillborn child. I had never done it. They teach you a lot of things in theology. They, they, they teach you how to preach, which is homiletics. They teach you how to interpret the scriptures. It is hermeneutics. They teach you about the nature of Christ, but they never teach you about moments like those where the family which has lost a possible joy in their entire life, they had plans for this little beautiful thing, and suddenly she is still born. And I searched the scriptures from beginning up until the end. I did not know which verse should I quote. What am I going to say to these people to, con to, to, uh, as, uh, to, to, um, to, to send my, condo my condolences? And one time in the, mon in the morning, uh, in the morning of the day of the funeral, I really thought about it that I don't have anything to say. I will just simply tell them that God loves them and that there is hope for resurrection, but I did not even know what I was talking about when I say that in terms of the theology of resurrection. Um, but when I went to the venue of the funeral, there were so many people from different, from different provinces coming together to actually comfort one another. Yes, comfort one another. And I overheard one of them, one of the relatives and family members saying, we haven't, we haven't seen each other for more than 20 years. What an opportunity today that we are going to be able to see each other. And, I then, and then I, I realized that God never wastes painful moments in our lives. He makes sure that even in things which we think are disastrous, painful, he makes us to learn lessons that there is still beauty 
in some ugliness of this life and that there is hope in making sure that we look at the positive side of things because there were aunts and uncles, relatives, friends who were coming from far and near coming together and seeing each other for the first time after a long time and what a happiness, what joy and happiness there. I'm not saying there was no, no, no hurt and pain, but it was important for us to look at what God, how God is able to write straight on crooked lines. When we have no hope, when we don't think we can salvage anything from a situation, God says, I can because I care about you. When criticized, we must praise God, which is really very, very difficult. We need to beware of self-pity. Never indulge the feeling that you are not esteemed as you should be, that your efforts are not appreciated, that your work is too difficult. Let the memory of what Christ has endured for us silence every murmuring thought. The Lord has no place in his work for those who have a greater desire to win the crown than to bear the cross. He wants men and women who are more intent upon doing, doing their duty than upon receiving the reward, the reward. Men who are more solicitous to, for principle than for pressure, but than for, for principle than for promotion. Praise, praise the Lord. We cannot afford to let our spirit chafe under real or supposed wrong done to ourselves. Self is the enemy we most need fear. No form of vice has a more baleful effect upon the character than as human passion not under the control of the Holy Spirit. No other victory can we gain, can, we can gain, will be so precious as the victory gained over self. Praise the Lord. Our Heavenly Father has a thousand ways provided to provide for us of which we know nothing. Those who accept the one principle of making service of God supreme will find perplexities vanish and a plain path before their feet. And it says here, he has got thousands, many, many ways to solve our problems. When we are complaining about a problem, God is actually having a predicament as to which one of these thousand ways can he apply to solve your, your problem? And it is important for us to know that God never, he has promised that he will be with us even unto the end of the world. It is important also to speak well of other people. Cultivate the habit of taking, talking well with others. Dwell upon the good qualities of those with whom you associate and see as little as possible of their errors and failings. When tempted to complain of what someone say, has said or done, praise something in that person's character. Cultivate the spirit of thankfulness. And I'm reminded of a, a, a classmate of mine called Nkanezeni Lichokoth, a tall guy who was very clumsy. Uh, he will come to school every day at around nine o'clock and will be the one who will walk in in the classroom and everything like that. And he was not so uh, brilliant. He was uh, always the last in the class. Uh, but my teacher, Mr. Nemapo, will make sure that when Nkanezeni comes early in the morning and as he gets into the classroom, he will actually say, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, stand up, put your hands together. The most brilliant man in the world, even though he knew that he was not, and he was speaking about his brilliance because although he was not very good in the classroom, he was one of the best upcoming young farmers in the community. And he was able to save even the community. And he will say, the man and his soul. Here he comes. Ladies and gentlemen, stand up and give him an applause. It is the man. He is, we are privileged to have him in the classroom. And you could see that he walks now with confidence that he's going to be able to make it. It says we need to, although we should not tell lies, okay, we need to cultivate a spirit of praising something good in other people. A person cannot just be bad from top to bottom. There must be something, a lesson which you can learn even in the most discouraging circumstances. It says here, if you do not feel lighthearted and joyous, do not talk of your feelings. 
cast no shadow upon the lives of others. A cold, sunless religion never draws souls to Christ. It drives them away from him into the nets that Satan has spread for the feet of the straying. Instead of thinking of your discouragements, think of the power you can claim in Christ's name. Let your imagination take hold upon things unseen. It is important for us to know that God is willing to do everything we ask for. If we ask in Jesus' name, and if it is his will. It is important for us to know that God is able to change a situation that is dire to put it in a manner that will make us to be happy again. And the, that old song, that song which I like very much says, we praise thee, O God, for the son of thy love. For Jesus who died and is now gone above, we praise thee, O God, for thy spirit of light, who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. All glory and praise to the God of all grace, who has bought us and sought us and guided our ways. Revive us again, fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. And the chorus says, Hallelujah. Then the glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, then the glory, revive us again. The last thing we need to thank God for, beautiful, is that it is not because of our education, nor our smartness, not because of the clothes we wear, not because of the cars we drive, it is not because of the houses we have, not because of our possessions, nor our positions. It is because of grace that our names will be written in the books of life. How cool is that? That not our merits are going to be used before the judgment bar of God. God will look at us and say, you are filthy. And you can agree with the devil and say, yes, I'm filthy, but I'm a sinner saved by grace. By grace. And suddenly the, 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 the focus shifts from you and you are going to be admitted in heaven, not because of your merits, but because of the merits of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. We thank God for this hope that even though we can go through terrible things today, mountains we cannot tunnel through, even though we can have bad things happen in our lives, we are looking forward to that day when we are going to see God see face to face. And John the Revelator has a beautiful way of putting it. I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And I, John, saw the holy city prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for the bridegroom. And I heard the voice of the Lord say, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. They shall be his people, and God will be with them and be their God. He shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more sickness, no more sorrow, no more death. For the old order of things have passed away. He has prepared that place for you. You do not deserve it, but because of his grace, which is always sufficient, his mercies that are renewed every morning, he has you in his mind. And what a beautiful thing that is. We need to praise God in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we thank you so much for salvation so full and free, for the sun which shone this morning, for the birds which are singing, for brothers and sisters, for this great family which are prisoners of hope. And we thank you, dear Father, that you are coming again to take us home so that where you are, there we may be also. May you seal this hope within our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.